Hey, friends. How's it going? Thank you for uh, spending some time with us today. Appreciate it. This is uh, only the second talk that I have given in person in two years. So if I mess it up, that's why I'm a little bit nervous. I'm also not used to having uh, everyone standing. Uh, so I, I guess it's probably not appropriate. I don't know if you can sit on the floor, but don't, don't feel like if you're uncomfortable, we've got chairs in the backs. Uh, so you're all kind of like standing and staring at me, which is a little bit unusual for, uh, for a talk. Um, so I wanted to put together something that was a little keynote-y. They say that uh, keynotes are supposed to be about big thinking, about getting people to change their perspective on stuff. And one of the things that I've been thinking about during the pandemic is remote work, uh, how to make people successful when I don't get to interact with them in person. I've got people that I've hired to work with me at Microsoft who have never, I've never seen them. I don't know how tall they are. They're about, about this big. Uh, in little squares. Uh, they're always either way taller or way shorter than I would have expected when I do meet them. We've got some people who have been hired and have never been in an office before. So uh, people come to me with questions about remote work, about what it's like to work remotely, and we talk about that. And I'm also starting to realize now that I've been in tech, this is my 30th year uh, coding for money. So I'm officially an old programmer. I think I get to say that now. And I'm thinking about what does that mean as I head towards the last few years of my career? What does that mean for folks that are just getting started? So if there's folks here with less than, than 10 years in the business, you, 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 you babies, I love you. Uh, what does it mean to grow the next generation of developer? Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk about that today. We're talking about mentorship, sponsorship, and uh, systems thinking and how it's enabled me to, uh, to work with a number of new developers. Right off the bat, I was told my slides were unprofessional because I used Comic Sans as a font. Uh, the NDC folks have a very high standard. I came with this. They were immediately disappointed. So I came up with a better, um, better font that was a little bit more attractive. Looks like my slides are not moving. This is the first thing. It looks like this runs Java, so I can't, can't rely on that. There we go. Should have got a .NET clicker. So there's a professional font, much nicer. And then I put some, uh, some title there. But then I was told that the young people prefer evocative stock photography. You have to have a photograph that shows how fancy your office is. So I put together uh, one of those. So that's my office. Uh, that's what everyone's office looks like, really. It's, it's very typical programmer's office, wouldn't you say, with a, the sun streaming in on a Sunday afternoon, no clutter of any kind on the desk. It's a very typical programmer office. Uh, this is uh, actually what a programmer's office looks like. That's uh, more typical. Uh, actually, that's what an old programmer's office looks like. So I joke about this a little bit, and I talk about how, well, that's what a real programmer's desk looks like, and no, that's what a real programmer's desk looks like. The problem with that sentence isn't those two desks, it's real programmer, right? A real programmer's desk looks like your desk. It looks like whatever it should look like. It looks like whatever space you're building for yourself that makes you happy. I've seen people, we've all seen people where we go to their desk and we go, how do you work? Like you look at their icons on their desktop, and you're like, oh, what are you doing? What is, what, whatever you're doing, it's wrong. But if it's working for them, then it must be explicitly right. So we're changing our perspectives about what a real programmer looks like. Some of them look like this, and some of them look like this, and that's OK. What we want to do, whether it be at NDC or anywhere, is we want people to feel welcome. We want people to feel like they can do their best work. Now. Uh, of course, the pandemic happened, and right off the bat, we started to see hustle culture. You familiar with that term, hustle? That means that you're not successful because you're not working hard enough. You've got to hustle. You've got to hustle more, right? You've got to want it, man, right? This is not the NDC way. This is not the way, is it? We don't like these kind of people. Just do it, Denny. Do it. Work harder. Yeah. No. Do you have a good system? Does it work for you? Awesome. That's great. It makes me happy. One of the things people told me during the pandemic is they said, well, you're working from home. You got all this spare time. You know, if you didn't learn Chinese during the pandemic, what are you doing with all, with all the free time, right? If you didn't learn F sharp in the cloud uh, during all your free time, as far as I'm concerned, if you survive the pandemic and you still have a job at the end, you're doing a great job and I appreciate you. So folks would come to me and they'd say, 
oh, I need to work harder to get better at work. You know, I'm a new programmer. I need to put in 60 hours a week, 80 hours a week. This is hustle culture. And while it's good to work hard, while it's good to hustle, it's good to be passionate, it's good to get up in the morning excited, it's not okay for us to tell our early in career developers the reason you're not successful is because you're not doing 80 hours a week. Hustle culture is not, not healthy. You don't do 30 years in the software industry with the philosophy of wake up, kick ass, and repeat. You've got to find balance. This is a marathon, not a sprint. I think all of us have been burned out at some time. Anyone ever felt what burnout really feels like? Yeah. And burnout, you know how burnout starts, is you do your, you do your nine to five, or your nine to six, or your seven to seven, and you go home, and you see your partner, and you see your kids, and you go, you know, I'm a little behind at work. I'm just gonna work late to catch up. And the next thing you know, it's 2 a.m. And then it's 7 a.m., and then you did it again and you keep doing that repeat because you think, I'll just catch up. It's a busy time, you know. We're in that kind of April, May, June, July kind of, that's a busy time at work, June, July, August, September, kind of October, November, December, January, February, March, kind of that. It's a busy time at the work and we'll hustle in order to make that time. And then we realize that that's become our lifestyle. That's really unhealthy. And then we don't like ourselves we don't like our jobs, we don't like our careers, and then we do it to the new generation. <laughs> we inflict it upon the next gen because we put in our work. I did hustle, I did crunch time, so then you have to do it too so that you can, you can suffer. <laughs> I don't mean to do it like that, but we do do that, don't we? Well, I, um, my, my son is 16 and he's learning how to drive a car. So when I learned to drive a car, I was very excited. I was like, I'm gonna drive this wonderful car that my dad, my dad has. And my dad says, uh, before you get to drive the car, I need you to change your own oil, change a tire, rebuild an engine, right? Because his dad taught him how to do that and that's how real drivers, right? You, know, you wanna learn to drive a car? You wanna go to the school dance? That's great. Let's talk about the theory of the internal combustion engine. You want to learn C-sharp? Before we learn C-sharp, let's talk about assembler because you don't deserve a memory manager. Garbage collector, you're garbage, right? That's, that's not how we want to do things. Like, think about it. Computers, there's a famous quote that says, computers are where we took a rock, we put lightning in a rock, and we made it think. So you don't get to use a computer until you too have taken two sticks and rubbed them together and made fire, and then we'll get you the computer. So as an, as an elder programmer, I have discovered that one of my biases, one of my biases, the things that I'm internally biased against is, is young people. They're the worst. <laughs> don't trust anybody under 30. They don't know what they're doing. Some people may be biased against people of different cultures or people of different uh, races. I realize that my bias, my, my internal reaction is young people. They don't know what they're talking about. But then I realize that that's not right. That's not healthy. The only difference between me and a young programmer is that I'm old. I'm still here. So then I realize that I need to make space for those young programmers so that they become old programmers. That's my job. So I catch that bias internally, and I catch those moments where I want them to drive stick shift before they drive automatic, because I think that's right. So I'm starting to reevaluate those biases, and it's really made a big difference in my life. So when, when quarantine happened, everyone called me and said, hey, Scott, you've been a remote worker at Microsoft for 15 years. Tell me what it's like to be a remote worker. And I realized that, well, working in quarantine sucks. You're in jail but working remotely is a joy. You can go to Starbucks or a cafe. You can sit in the corner and work. So I don't know what it's like to work during uh, a quarantine or a pandemic. So I didn't have a lot of good tips, but I did tell them that you don't want to overwork. That is the thing. We've all found, as we have worked remotely, and some of us have gone back to the office, we found that that commute, that hour commute, ended up just being work. So now we're working an extra hour in the morning and an extra hour at night, and nobody noticed it. And that's not healthy. So I, watch, I want people to watch what's going on in their own bodies, in their own brains. 
So I'm going to talk today about intentionality and deliberate thinking, doing things because you decided to do a thing as opposed to just letting things happen by default. One of the things that I'm seeing a lot of is, um, is doom scrolling. Doom, you guys know what doom scrolling is? I'm really not enjoying this clicker. There we go. Doom scrolling is scrolling on social media for really awful, sad things about how the world is ending and everything sucks. And then when you find something, you confirms your belief that the world sucks, and then you look for more stuff. Turns out that scrolling for doom is not healthy. So I started realizing that I would be on the toilet looking for reasons the world was ending. And there's just something about poo and the world ending that just makes you sit sadly in the bathroom. And uh, I don't know if it's the sitting and the pooping part, but it's just really not good, healthy behavior. You didn't think you were going to go to an NDC keynote and learn about my poop, but now you're here, and that's what we have. The reason that I'm saying this is because we don't talk about this stuff. You all are doing this, but you don't tell your partners or your friends. You're sad. You think it sucks, and you think it's going to get better if you go into Twitter and you pull to refresh and you find some new bit of information. So I'm being much more intentional. I'm being much more deliberate about what I'm putting into myself. I'm intentional about my work. I'm intentional about how I'm dealing with young people. I'm intentional, intentional on how I'm consuming media. And I'm trying to be more present. I'm trying to be more present and in my space. I mentioned before that I've been coding now, and this is now in, uh, 2022, so it's been 30 years. I could use that 30 years as a, as a cudgel. Hey, you have an idea about some coding? Bonk. I've been doing this 30 years. That's not healthy. But here's the other thing. Have I really been doing it 30 years? I was kind of asleep for seven of that. Now, I'm not saying like I was you know, in the club, like I don't even remember the 90s, man. Not that kind of forgetting. Just kind of like doing your job and not really thinking about it, not being present and in the moment. So there's years of my experience that didn't really count. About seven of them I count. It's a couple of years in the 90s, a couple of years in the early 2000s where I wasn't really thinking. So when the pandemic happened, and I not only was working remotely, but I was stuck working remotely, I started getting deliberate and intentional. And I started building a nest. Nesting is super important. A lot of you didn't sign up to work remotely, did you? You just had to work remotely. So then you're on your kitchen counter, or you're in your spare bedroom, or you're in your, on your back porch somewhere. You found a space. Did you intentionally sit down and build a place for yourself? Or did, it, did a place just happen by default? For most people, it just happened. We have a lady at work who is inside her pantry, the little room that you keep your like beans and rice in. She just made a space. Is that in my head, or is that here? I thought I was having a stroke there, brother. Yeah. I was like, it's happening. I'm OK. Um, so I made a nest. I have a spare bedroom. I'm very blessed to have a little extra bedroom. So I made a space. I put pictures in that space that feed my spirit. I put my monitors the way that I wanted. I don't have a lot of money, but I wanted a million dollar room. It turns out with paint and IKEA, you can have a million dollar room for 300 bucks. <laughs> so I got, some, I got some Billy shelves for my, my, my stuff and my pictures. I got a standing desk, and I found a nice chair on, uh, on Craigslist. I got a used chair, and I, I nested. And I was intentional about it. When I say intentional, I realized when I thought about myself that I was moving from one bedroom to another bedroom. And that didn't give me enough space between work and home. So I painted the room a deep chocolate brown, like a library. I put shelves in the room and window coverings in the room that looked nothing like the rest of the house. This room doesn't match our decor, according to my wife. Uh, so it looks completely different, and that's on purpose. And then I commute. Some of you commute by rolling out of bed, and it's the second roll, and now you're at work, right? 
right? If you can reach your phone like that, that is too close to work. I would encourage you to put work farther away. So I actually commute. I get out of the house, and I walk around the block, and then I come around, and I turn back, and I go into another door. That's stupid, right? Well, it works for me. That's the thing. I knew that something wasn't working. I explored it. I thought about it. And I decided a new way would work. And I came up with a new way. So I'm encouraging people that are early in career. I have some people who came directly out of college. And now they're in a little one-bedroom apartment in Seattle somewhere working for Microsoft. They've never met anyone from work. They've never been to the, uh, the, uh, the campus. And those folks are not being intentional about their space. So they roll out of their bed, and they put their laptop on their kitchen counter, and they work. And it's sad, and it's starting to tear them down. So first thing I would do is encourage you all to make a nest. Then ask yourself, is this the time to create? Is the time that I'm set up for myself the right time to make stuff? I think this is falling off. I'm not sure what's happening here. Sorry about that. Can I get my friend to help me? Is this falling, or am I, is my head changing shape in real time? Thanks, boss. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. So is the time that you're choosing to create the right time? Is, are you most productive in the afternoon? Are you most productive in the morning? Find those times and set them up for yourself. We're all sick of meetings. We're all tired of these things. Apply intentionality to when you're going to create. And then a lot of the early in career people have been asking me, well, I don't really feel like making anything. I'm overwhelmed. I'm not really good at anything. Everyone is an expert at something. And you're especially an expert in your own journey and your own experience. So as I'm trying to explore my biases towards young people, I'm realizing that a lot of these young people are experts at stuff that I don't know about. Right? When I went to school in the 90s, Kubernetes didn't exist. So, you know, I'm an expert on it only if I work in a production system. You can't become an expert on something just by reading about it. So I'm learning a lot from these things. And I'm encouraging young people and early in career people to think about what are the things that they're an expert at and having them write about it. I'm also hearing a lot of people talk about inclusion and wanting more people to feel comfortable in tech. And I've seen old programmers like myself have a little bit of an unwelcoming attitude. And it made me realize that we didn't always have this. This is a, a magazine, an actual physical magazine, back when we had those, from 1984, where this young lady is programming on a TI-99. She's got her bubble gum, got her pigtails. And that was what I grew up on. That's what I thought tech was like. It was just nerds doing awesome stuff. And I want people to, to feel like that when they enter the space. But there's this thing called the technology priesthood. And this is no disrespect. This is just a religious uh, analogy. There was a time, a thousand years ago, when regular people didn't read. Right? Only the priests would read. The regular people would ask the priests for information. And the priests would be like, well, let me, let me look that up. But da, 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 don't look at it. Just let me see. And then they would, and they would go, OK, well, it says here. And then they would tell them. So the relationship between information and the people who wanted information was not balanced. This quote here is, knowledge is power, and it tends to be hoarded. Experts in a field rarely want people to understand what they do. That sounds like something you would say in, on, on Twitter in 2022. That's actually a quote from a computer magazine from 1974. So people were noticing this, this, this technology priesthood, this, this um, gatekeeping, standing at the gate and saying, no, you can't come in. Have you ever gone to your family holiday events, and you see your cousins, and your grandmother, and your aunties and uncles, and you know that the responsibility of the computer person at the family event is to set up their printer, to run Windows Update, right? I mean, you know, right? OK? Have you ever met like a cousin you haven't seen in a while, and the conversation is like, hey, how's it doing? What do you, what do, you do? Oh, you're a computer person. Oh, I'm not a computer person. I don't know anything about computers. And then you kind of fade away. We've created this environment by which there are computer people and then everyone else, right? Where being able to go file Save As, that's a thing you put on your LinkedIn. Like, you know, do you know Office? I do know Office. Do you know how to go Save As? Mm, less so. 
right? I'm an office worker, but I don't really know where my files are, right? So do you know where your files are? Young people, they don't even know that the file system's a thing. My kid's 16, no idea where the files are. They're in Google Drive or they're in OneDrive, but otherwise, if they were on C colon temp, you're never gonna see that file again, it's over. So what have we done as computer people to, to take a relationship that should be like this and we made it like this? We made them feel bad. My non-technical parent calls me and says, I don't know what I did to the computer. I think I broke it. The relationship with the system is broken. So I'm trying to get people to think about that. It could be a system at work and you're talking to a new programmer who's only been in the business for a couple of years. I think I broke it. I think I broke production. I think I dropped a table in production. And then we make them feel bad about that rather than thinking about how do we have systems that would allow someone who just got here to break production? It's not their fault, it's the system's fault. So you gotta think about those things. And I talk about this term gatekeeping. Gatekeeping are, these are the decision makers that sit in a place and control information flow. So as someone at Microsoft who's kind of a middle to upper manager like me, I can gatekeep if I choose to. If I wanna teach someone C Sharp and I say you have to learn C first and then you have to learn C++ and then you get C Sharp, I don't make the rules. Well, actually, I do exactly make the rules, right? We always hear that phrase, I don't make the rules. Turns out you do. You can change the rules. I was teaching classes on C-sharp and computer science from the metal up. Let's learn about assembler. Let's learn about C. Let's learn about memory management. Okay, now we don't need memory management. I was teaching it about history. But the kids, the younger people, are learning from the glass of their monitor back, not the metal up, the glass back. They load up, they hit F12 tools in Chrome or Edge, and they go, look, that's JavaScript. That's the source code for the internet. It's not for me to say, well, actually, I just let it go. They just don't need to know that stuff. So if we bring it back to my son who's trying to learn how to drive, does he need to know stick shift? Now we get into a real conversation about what gatekeeping means. Here's where I struggle as a person of a certain age. If you drive a car and you know how to drive manual, you have a different relationship with the car. I would argue you are a better driver. You know more about how it works and if it has a problem, you're gonna be able to get through it. That said, what if he just wants to ride in an Uber? platform as a service. Let's say that the car has a flat tire. He gets in another Uber. I assume that the other Uber is garbage collected. I don't know what happens. I don't know that guy, <laughs> right? That guy, good luck, Uber guy. But if he doesn't understand that, that the tire can break and the Uber driver has to fix that tire, then does he even know the Uber driver exists? Does he have empathy for the existence of that driver? Wouldn't it be nice if he had the power to get out of the car and help the person with the, with the tire? So then the question is, how far down should he go? Should he rebuild the engine with the gentleman? Should he fix that person's oil? I didn't say you need to be a mechanic. I do think you should take the level that you operate at and go one level below. If you drive automatic, learn stick shift. Do it once or twice, so it's in your, it's in your brain. You don't have to do it professionally. I didn't ask you to be a race car driver, but you don't get to go from Uber rider to F1 racer without understanding the stack. So we need to think about those things. When someone is gonna be doing their job, what do they need to know to be really effective at their jobs? So while I'm gonna let my son drive an automatic, I am gonna have him drive manual a couple of times so that he can get out of trouble if he needs to. He's just gonna go one level down the call stack than where he's used to. So if you can do that, then you can start sharing your experience about what you've learned and you can put out good work and you can tell people about it. So the other thing that I've been telling people to do is not to waste their keystrokes. This is a thing that happens at work where people are writing really long emails during the pandemic. If your email scrolls, I'm not gonna read your email. <laughs> right, email is where uh, keystrokes go to die, <laughs> right? Let's say after this talk, 
one of you lovely people sends me a note and says, hey, great talk, Scott, I have a question. I never thought of that question. That question's a gift. What a great question, Denny. Thank you so much for that question. But, you know, look, Denny and I are friendly, but I'm not going to give Denny 5,000 of my keystrokes for free. <gasps> I don't know you like that, right? Because I want to go and write seven paragraphs, and Denny's going to be like, thanks. <laughs> All right, so that was great. Thank you for that gift. I just wasted an hour typing, and, uh, and now, you know, PayPal me, I guess. What should I do? I should put those keystrokes in a blog post or a wiki or literally anywhere with a URL. Send the URL to my friend and then go to sleep. And then those keystrokes will live while I am sleeping. <laughs> True story. Conserve your keystrokes. You have a finite number of keystrokes left in your hands before you die. Yeah, a little morbid. People, that laughter right there, that was the laughter of pain, is that was what that was. That was the like, <laughs> I made a website for you, painful laughter guy. Keysleft.com. I can't see, because I'm old. Keysleft.com. How many keys do you have left? Let's say that laughter guy is 29, a crisp 29. He types 80 words a minute. He has 281 million keystrokes left, and it's going down right now because he's not typing. <laughs> okay, this is assuming you're going to live to be 90 and you're going to be a salary person your whole life. But you have 93 novels left in your hands. Why aren't you writing novels, man? You've got uh, 28,000 love letters. Do better. Or a million and a half emails to your boss. <laughs> right? Where do you want your time to go? This is that intentionality that we were talking about. I want people to be thinking about intentionality and what you're doing with your time and why you're spending your time doing the things you're going to do. So one of the ways that I'm becoming a better mentor and a better manager at work is I'm writing less emails and I'm writing more documents. I'm writing less emails, and I'm putting content in places where I can have a, a URL. I'm going to have a new employee start soon. I'm not going to write the same email that I write every time a new employee. I'm going to use an existing one. I'm going to save my keystrokes. This is helping people do better at work because writing things down culture supports people in other time zones. You write the document, and then you go to sleep. The document gets forwarded around. It gets talked about. Everybody wins. So that's an important tip. And then again, I come back to that point where people feel like they are, and I really don't like this clicker. Come on, clicker. People feel like maybe they're not expert enough at something. We are all amateurs. I said I've been doing this for 30 years. Everything I learned in school, except for C, is dead. Every single thing that I learned in school is gone. None of these things exist anymore. No one's writing stuff in DOS in Object Pascal which is what I learned in 1991, right? Very few people are writing x86 assembler right now. Most people are doing text boxes over data. So it's caused me to reevaluate that experience. I said that about seven years of my experience are repeated. Do you have 20 years experience or do you have the same year 20 times? We know these people at work. They don't come to NDC so we can talk about them because they're not here. You know this person. I've been here 20 years, young person. Respect my experience. You've literally had the same job doing the exact same thing for 20 years. It is the same year 20 times. Now, that doesn't mean you have to switch jobs. It means you have to wake up. You just go, huh, is this a process that can be improved? Is this a system that I can change? Is there an interaction with how I deal with people that I can modify? And in doing that, it keeps things fresh and it keeps you in the business longer. This gentleman here is Tim Berners-Lee. He invented the World Wide Web. Lovely gentleman. One of the things that I love about him is that he has a title down here that is very modest. All the young people want to be senior engineers. You want to be a senior web developer? You can be a senior web developer when Berners-Lee puts senior in front of his name. But until that happens, we're all just web developers. If, if I were Berners-Lee, I would just put the. Right? 
That's a flex. That is a flex. Yeah, you're a senior developer. I'm the web developer. I love that because he's very modest. He understands that there's things that he doesn't know, and I appreciate that. So I'm not too old to get a mentor. I want to get a mentor. I want someone who can teach me their perspective on systems. Just because I was there when the internet was built doesn't mean that I know everything about it. There's new thinking in distributed systems, in Kubernetes, in platform as a service, in the cloud. The cloud didn't exist when I got a degree. Understanding those kinds of things, I can get benefits from a younger person. And a younger person can go and be a mentor. So if you're thinking about mentorship and sponsorship, I would encourage you to not only find someone to mentor you, even though you are later in your career, but I would encourage you to find uh, a mentee that is possibly of a different age. That has been really, really inspiring for me. A lot of young people don't expect an old head like me to ask them for their advice, but they light up when they do. I, I was not a good mentor for a while. I use these, this, these hand gestures to indicate the power relationship between people, like when you're talking to your boss. Hey, this is my boss. Oh, I'm so sorry, boss. Right? You want to talk to people like peers. When I was a mentor, I, I made the mentorship relationship a weekly lecture from an old dude. I didn't mean to, but I'm an old dude, and I have all this information, so you should listen to me. So every week, I'll mentor you by being an old dude at scale. And that's not cool. In fact, I needed to change that relationship and be more intentional about it and think about what it is a mentor is supposed to do. A mentor is supposed to help someone else define their dream, think about their strengths, give them advice, and guide them, not lecture. That's what parents do. And I didn't want to be someone else's secondary parent. <laughs> then I realized that there's a fundamental difference between mentorship, which can be uh, a finite amount of time, it can be for different reasons, and sponsorship, which is giving opportunities to people that they wouldn't ordinarily have. Sometimes we hear this term luck thrown around a lot, say, oh, I'm very lucky. And then other people don't like that, and they kind of they bristle at that term, luck. I worked hard for everything I did. I, there was no luck involved. Ugh. The problem is the answer is both. Luck is opportunity plus being prepared. You worked hard. You were prepared. Opportunities happened, though, and you were ready for them. If you were super prepared and no opportunity presented itself, you'd be like, oh, I'm so unlucky and everything is bad. I'm going to work harder and be more prepared. But if the opportunities don't arrive, there's nothing you can do about it. So when we acknowledge things like privilege, sometimes people don't like that word, we acknowledge luck, we realize that, yeah, sure, you worked hard. No one's saying you didn't work hard. But you were also very fortunate to have opportunities presented to you. When I was 12, my grade five teacher let me take the computer home. Okay, this is the 80s. We didn't have a computer per classroom. Every kid didn't have a Chromebook. There was a computer. Not for the class, for the school. There was an Apple II. This was a poor school. She let me sneak it out of the building on Friday nights. My dad would back the pickup truck up against the school, and we would squirrel the computer into the back of the thing through a window, and we would steal it off into the night. And I would have it back by Sunday so that no one knew it was gone. This is a teacher enabling me. Why me? I don't know where the other kids in the neighborhood are. I don't know who else. No one else had that opportunity. There was only the one computer. What was it that she saw in me to allow me to do that? What a gift that was. There's some parallel universe that's split in half with some Loki variant version of me that's probably in jail for fake IDs and white collar crime that didn't get that computer because that fifth grade teacher, Mrs. Hill, saw something in me. I was ready and the opportunity arose, but she created luck for me. She made luck. And for me to forget that almost 40 years later would disrespect all the work that she'd done. She was not just a mentor, she was a sponsor. So we hear about privilege, 
being a man and being this and being that, one of the things we don't talk about much is what's called level privilege. If you're a VP at your company, that's powerful. You're much more powerful than the junior engineer. Do you know that when I email like junior engineers at work, I don't really think about my spelling, but when I email my VP, woo, I check the spelling. <laughs> she is gonna get a clean, crisp email with indentation and bullet points and maybe a little emoji or two just to be professional. <laughs> Does you think she knows that I'm doing that? You know you're doing that. You know you're careful when you email your boss, and that's totally different than you email the intern. That's level privilege. The thing that's fun about level privilege, you have unlimited level privilege. I will not run out. So if a new engineer comes to the company, what does it cost me to say, I'm just gonna use you as an example, Denny, because you're standing right here. I'm like, hey, Denny, uh, you know, that was actually Denny's work. Let's, uh, let's have him present to the, the all hands. That'd be great. Oh, yeah, you know, Anwan had some thinking about that. Why don't you go ahead and tell the, the group what that was about? One moment. I have unlimited number of those. That means I don't do that once a week and then go, ha, ha, I'm such a good, I'm an ally for the people. Yes, pet, pet, pet. No, do it all day. You can do warm introductions. People don't realize that the good old boys network and tech, it's just warm introductions. Oh, you're friends with them and I'm friends with them, so then we must be friends. A to B, B to C, A to C. Okay, cool. Well, we're cool and he knows you, you must be cool. I'll introduce you to this job. The warm introduction is how we create luck for people that didn't exist. Now, they have to work hard. Nobody's getting jobs for just hanging out and being pretty. They have to do the work, right? But they have to be ready, and then the opportunity presents itself. So what I'm trying to do and encourage us to do is to think about how can we put a spotlight on someone? How can we create luck? They may never know. This is important. They may never know you created that luck. And it's important that you not tell them. You remember 10 years ago when I had you present in front of the vice president? That was, that, that was me. That wasn't you. Just want to let you know. Just to minimize all that hard work that you put in. No, you don't do that. That's called transactional networking. You don't want to network with people and then keep track and keep score. But what I love doing, I love doing is I'll come to a conference like this and afterwards someone will say, 14 years ago, you retweeted something of mine and it made me have the confidence to quit my job and I started this little business. Does that mean that I created their little business and I did all the hard work? No. I just gave them a spotlight and I forgot about it. And that was the moment. That was their Mrs. Hill gave you a computer moment. Do that more, friends. Don't go a week without introducing someone to someone you know, without giving a young person at work a chance to give a presentation in front of the team. They might not succeed. Then wait a little while and give them a spotlight later. There's a whole spectrum of sponsorship. You can strategize. You can connect people. You can give opportunities. You can advocate. What is an advocate? That's someone who's talking nice about you when you're not in the room costs you nothing. What a joy. Once you get addicted to this, you're going to have so much fun telling people about all the great early and career folks that you're going to lift up and give opportunities to. It's so cool. Now, sometimes when people start mentoring, they're worried that um, they got to do it forever. Like it's a relationship or a marriage. You do not have to mentor them forever. You can break up with your mentor. What you do is you set up phases, reasons that you're doing your mentorship. We're going to focus on getting you to the next level, getting you that big promotion, getting you the transfer to the other project. That's, that's the, the boundaries of this mentorship relationship. What's your career phase and what's theirs? The person that you're mentoring should not be in your direct reports because it changes the power dynamic. And they shouldn't be someone who has power over you if you're being mentored. They should be diagonal to you in the business. I use that example of a time-shifted version of yourself. You know when you see someone, you say, you remind me of me. That's cool. You're probably meeting another variant of yourself that's time-shifted. That's perfect. They're diagonal to you. They're, they're you that took a different road. You can guide them and make them successful and make them the best version of themselves. 
and then again, make it a two-way street, not a regular scheduled lecture with an old person. So one of the things that I think is the most fun about being old in tech is having a lot of stories. So as we get towards the end here, and we're all standing, and we're kind of getting a vibe and feeling about what we're going to see next here at NDC and all the great talks that we're going to have, I'm going to share a couple of fun stories about things in tech. And this is what's great. I want the young people to collect their own stories so that they can tell them as well. So I'm going to share a couple of mine. And these are the things that I talk about with my mentees. First thing is that they ask me, what should I specialize in? What, what technology should I pick? I don't freaking know. I mean, what do I know? Like, am I going to go, Kuber, Kubernetes? That's the thing, right? Probably not Web3, whatever it is. But the thing that, you're, the thing that you want to do, I don't know. You want to be a T-shaped developer. You ever heard that term, T-shaped? You know, the shape of the letter T? You want to be broad, understand systems, computers have CPU and memory and networking and storage, and then the T goes deep in one thing. I don't care if that one thing is Rust or Go or C Sharp or whatever. That top part of the T has to be broad. The analogy I use is the Swiss Army knife. That's, the, that's why the Swiss Army is the power they are today, the Swiss Army knife. This is a great little knife. My dad gave me a Swiss Army knife when I was 12. This knife is useless. There's nothing here. There's a, I mean, th I think this is a wine cork of some kind. I've never used that. Um, it's got tiny scissors. It's got a tiny pliers, but it's a pretty good knife. It's kind of T-shaped. It's got a bunch of things that it's kind of OK at, and then it goes deep in the knife. There's like three knives. That's the way I want to be as a developer. I don't want to be a specialized tool, because what if that thing goes away? I can take any one of those tools and improve it and make it better and go deeper on it. So if C Sharp dies or if Kubernetes isn't the next thing, the fundafreakinmentals are still there. So it's OK to be a funny little knife that's not amazing at everything. You just want to be at least a good knife. I see a lot of exciting people coming into tech, and they're focused on a technology. I want to learn JavaScript. But then they don't know how to drive stick shift. They don't know about how JavaScript fits into the ecosystem. They don't have systems thinking. They just learned how to write a for loop in JavaScript. And that can be really challenging. So I talk about these things when I meet with my mentees and my sponsored folks. There's problem solving in tech. There's layering. There's composing systems. And there's patterns. Let's start with problem solving. Problem solving is asking yes, no questions at scale. This is the difference between an early in career and a later in career individual, is you know how you get stuck on a problem. You go find some senior programmer. And you've been thinking about this for hours. And they go, is it DNS? And you go, oh, crap, yeah, it's DNS. How did you do that? I've been thinking about this for days. And you went and you said it's that. And then you go, eh. The, the real answer is, eh, I'm old. I've seen a lot. It's always DNS, right? <laughs> Problem solving at scale, OK? Asking yes, no questions. So I went and gave this talk at, uh, at a young girl's coding seminar. And I'm sure they were thrilled to see me, right? Because they love the old, old guys on TikTok. Hey, kids. Hey, fellow kids. So I show up and I said, we're going to learn how to code. Yay. Um, and uh, I wanted to do something different, because this is a bunch of young, young high school kids. I think they were 14, 15-year-old girls. And I said, all right, my toaster is broken. And then I made it real awkward and cringe and just let it sit there. I thought we were going to learn how to code. Well, yeah, but I need toast. Can we fix, can we fix the toaster? What do you think I should do? And one of the kids is like, well, you should probably go and get a, uh, you should probably go get a new toaster. <laughs> OK, that's valid. That's a, pre that's a reasonable, my computer is broken. I'll buy a new computer, right? My toaster is broken. I want toast. Let's get a new toaster. But that's, I said, with all due respect to the kids, I said, that's a little simple, don't you think? I mean, there might be something I could fix, and I wouldn't have to buy a new toaster. Let's think about like, the system. What is the, where does the toaster exist in the world? And they're all kind of thinking. And then, and then somebody says, is the power on to the toaster? That's a great question. I like that. That's a yes, no question. I, I don't think the power is on. How would I check to see if the power is on? And they said, well, plug something else in. Now we're going. Now we're getting somewhere. OK, I plug in a lamp. 
to the same plug as the toaster lamp doesn't turn on. And they said, okay, did you blow a fuse? You know, my parents say that there's this fuse box. Maybe that's a thing. I just wanted toast. We're only five minutes in, and they're already thinking about electricity and how it flows, and they're thinking about how it enters the house. And then I, I, they say, is the power on at all? What a great question. The, no, I don't have any lights on in the whole house. And they're still trying to figure out what the questions to ask. And then one little girl in the front row who'd been real quiet said, do the neighbors have power? That's a programmer right there. I wanted toast, and she's looking out the window to see if the neighbor's lights are on. And I, and I said, think about that. I just want bread that's hot, and you're checking to see if the neighbors have power. Now, at this point, they're kids, so the whole thing goes off the rails. They want to know if there's been an EMP and aliens have taken over, you know, and I just wanted toast. But the point is, when you have a problem that is simple like that, you can either have a simple answer, buy a new toaster, which would not solve my toast situation at all. I would still have no toast if they bought a new one. But if you think about the system in which it exists, you're going to be able to do some damage. So early in career people, they Google for stuff. We see the memes. They joke about it on TikTok. I'm on Tech Talk, the TikTok version for techies. And they always joke about, oh, yeah, you know, uh, uh, Stack Overflow. You can be a senior engineer and make six figures on Stack Overflow or whatever. And actually, one of them uh, gave me a, uh, a gift saying that I, too, could be a senior engineer. Let me see if I have my gift in my, in my bag here. They actually gave me a, a Stack Overflow keyboard. It's got a copy button, a paste button, and a Stack Overflow button. And that's how you become a senior engineer at the company right there. That is simplistic thinking. That will only get you a job in tech or an interview in tech, and then you're going to get overwhelmed in tech, and you're going to quit tech. <laughs> we don't want to create people like that. So I was thinking about all the different things that one would need to make to, to debug a website. And just without looking anything up, without stack overflowing anything, I went and I made a list of all the different things that I would check. And I realized I could make a seven or eight page list. And then I thought about our famous American president, uh, Abraham Lincoln, who said, it's always DNS. <laughs> but on the left-hand side here, I have a whole list of things that it could be. Did not Google to get that list. I didn't even Google with Bing. I just, they just, they just came out of my head. Why do I know that stuff? Because it's happened before, because I've suffered. I've suffered. And there's this one here, I don't know if you can see it in the corner here, uh, that you have to be aware that sometimes it's never a certain thing. Uh, Sherlock Holmes says it's never twins. Now, that's be like if you've ever seen Sherlock Holmes, whether it be a movie or the book, usually like uh, a woman will kill her husband, and then they'll say, well, but she has an alibi. She was on the other side of town. So there's two of them. And they go, wait, hang on, how is that possible? She killed her husband, but she was on the other side of town. And then Watson says, Holmes, could it have been twins? And he goes, no, why not? It's never twins. There's just stuff like that that happens in tech that it's never going to be. And you're going to know those things. And you, you've had those interactions before where you go, could it be that? No, it's never, it's never that. Computers have a lot of layering issues. Layering is hiding complexity from yourself and others. Layering is also really just lying. You're lying to yourself with software. You're hiding stuff. Now, this is what email looks like, right? We've all sent an email before. Unless you've worked on an SMTP server, a simple mail transport protocol, you've never really seen what's behind that. I've spent my whole life never had to write a simple mail transfer protocol or a POP3, so I don't really know what's behind email. So I figured I'd look at it. That's what's behind email. It's name, colon, value, name, colon, value. And then on line 10 there, we see a content type. That's interesting. Where have I seen stuff like that? This is an HTML post, name, colon, value. Then I realized that the entire world is just name value pairs at scale. Redis, databases, Mongo, all of it. It's all a lie. Everything's just a big hash table in the cloud. Why do I say that? Because it's true. So this is important for an early in career person because when they start plugging the neurons in and realizing, well, that thing that I know is the same thing as that thing that I know, and then you plug them in. 
and you realize that maybe you already know the thing. These two ideas are the same. On the right is a record player with data that's encoded in a circle that gets picked up by a head. On the left is a hard drive with data encoded in a circle that gets picked up by a head. 150 years separate, same concept. And it's still a wheel. Isn't that interesting? Then you can start composing things, putting things together, and you can hide information and uh, compose large systems that are infinitely complex, but then you can still dig into them. There's this really great show on Netflix. Have you ever seen Altered Carbon? Altered Carbon is this great show. And on Altered Carbon, this gentleman on the right here uh, ha can, can change bodies. He can put his brain inside different bodies. And he meets the guy on the left who's actually an AI. So he's an artificial intelligent. And he's, he is the form of the poet Edgar Allan Poe. And the hotel he stays in is called The Raven. And if you've ever seen Altered Carbon, you'll know that there's, there's famous people playing the role, and then there's that guy who you don't know. He's a working actor, and I'm a big fan. And if you saw Altered Carbon, you'd know that he was amazing. He'd shoot it up. He carried this show, carried it. So I always like to tweet the kind of not famous people and tell them, hey, you did a great job. Because if I tweet the famous person, they're never going to see it. And they get compliments all the time. But the working actor, they never get it. So I'm going to just go and say, hey. And he had like 4,000 followers. He said, you were amazing. You were awesome. Good for you and all the best in your future success. And he tweets me back. And I noticed that his tweet has a geo-coded location. He's in Portland. I live in Portland. So if you know, you got to shoot your shot, my friends, because you miss all the shots that you don't take. So if I'm going to have a bromance with this man, i got to go right now while he's in front of his phone. And I said, hey, I see that you're in Portland. Yeah, yeah, we moved to Portland. Da, da. You want to get tacos? And we freaking got tacos, and we hung out, and it was amazing. And we went to tacos, and he shows up in a vest and, a, and like a, an ascot. It's like, are you European? Are you not European? Like, I don't know. You know how they can tell that you're an American from your clothes? You, know, you can see. You look at our shoes, and you're like, guys from America. Look at this. A vest, not a choice I would make, and, and like an ascot or like a, like a scarf. Very stylish. So we do a podcast, and I bring my recorder, and I interview him about his acting process, and it's amazing. And I'm like, this is my new buddy. I'm going to be friends with this guy. So I go home with my SD card, and I put it into the computer to get the interview off. And there was an infinite recursive directory of nothing. Blank, not even a space, literally nameless folders that recursed infinitely. I freaking felt it in my chest. I was going to die. What am I going to do? Do I call him and go, hey, remember that really amazing dinner talk? Can we do that again? Um, I'm a computer person, but I lost the file. Right? Because he thinks I'm an amazing computer guy, because I got like a blue check on Twitter, right? And he thinks I'm the man. And I'm going to tell him I lost the file? Oh, my God. So I go into Explorer, and Explorer says there's 300 megabytes there. And I'm like, ooh, but there's not. There's only John Travolta going like this. So I start digging and digging and digging, and I realize that if I'm ever going to be friends with this guy, I'm going to have to go and learn the file allocation table format for DOS. So I take the, the bits off of the SD card, and I make an array, and I have this 300 meg array of zeros. Uh, and I start reading and reading and reading, and I learn stuff about FAT, the file allocation table that you shouldn't know, like that row of zeros should be 002, and the date should not be 1980. And I start digging around in the bits, and I am not a low-level debugger, but I, I, I can't go on stage and talk about driving stick shift if I don't actually learn how to drive a stick shift. So this is the stick shift version of rebuilding a file system from scratch. So I manually rebuild the file allocation table on the SD card, and I dig the files out, and I find them, and I publish the interview. 
and he's still talking to me, and we're buddies, and we like text each other. So that is very exciting to me, um, because I could never have shown my face. The only choice would have been to move to another city. There is just no way out of this. Nothing in the computer is hidden from you. You can dig as far as you want. So I try to make sure that folks understand that you may be working in applications. You may be doing text boxes over data. But that sits on a file system. That sits on I.O. controls. And all the way down until there's a rock that we put lightning in and we taught it how to think. It's super important to understand that stuff. So then when you're old and you've been in tech for a long time, why are you so good? It's because you've seen it before. That's the only reason. And the way that you get to be old in tech is by not being chased out of tech by jerks. There were so many opportunities where I felt bad and I didn't belong. And think about how you must feel if you're an underrepresented person in tech. Don't chase them out because if they get in for 10 years, then they maybe will stay for 10 or 15 or 20 and they'll grow more people. My superpower, having seen 30 plus years of tech for money and 40 if you count not money, is I've seen it before. That's it. That is the power. One time I was debugging for 13 hours on a Raspberry Pi and I could not figure out why I couldn't get this app to work. And I had these files on a Raspberry Pi and I put one in a folder called good and I put one in a folder called bad. And the only difference between the two things was that little space there. I don't know if you can see, right up at the top there it says 2C and there's a space. All of the zero Ds were stripped out of my file. All of the zero Ds were missing. Why? Anyone know? Any old people know what's zero D and why it's missing? I spent 13 hours on this. Say it again. Sorry, what? OK. My, my contemporary here, contemporary means we're the same age. He says, carriage return? Thank you for not being there when I needed you <laughs> as a mentor. 13 hours ago, sir. Turns out there's a setting, treat files without extensions as ASCII. I was copying the file, and it treated a binary file as an ASCII file, and a 0D, as my fellow old person just said, that means carriage return. So I go, and I fix the problem, and I tell a young person at work, and they go, that's an amazing story. What's a carriage, and where is it returning to? <laughs> There's people, you, ex, experts in Git, that don't know what a carriage return is. So I said, well, let's talk about carriage returns. <laughs> it's returning the carriage. Why is it called a carriage? Because it carries or transports the paper. And it goes, doo -doo 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 -doo, ding, and you go, and you return the carriage. And then you line feed. And how does he know that? Because he's seen it before. He didn't learn that in school and remember it years later. He's seen it before. This, will, this bug will never fool me again. So you know how they say fail fast, fail often? The way I know that is because I failed a lot. So what we can do is we can make a space for early and career developers to fail comfortably often so that they might collect this stuff in their brains and be more successful developers and maybe even someday build a Lego typewriter uh, from scratch, which I think would be really exciting, right? So I'm going to fast forward to the end. Here's my homework for you all to think about. Where, what are your stories? Collect your stories, write them down, tell them to your mentees and your early in career folks, encourage them, inspire them. Do your stories humanize tech? Do they humanize you? My stories are all about how dumb I am. You may have noticed that and enable them to share their stories and give them a spotlight. We are so glad that you're here at NDC. Thank you very much. Have a great show.